Hello and welcome to Transmission. I'm Nate and tonight I'm joined by Dee. Welcome. Thank you. Now Dee, um, so you're from, um, from F2M Shed. Yep. Um, would you mind sort of telling us a little bit about what F2M Shed is? Well the F2M Shed is a great support um, gathering. Mm -hmm. uh, we meet once a month uh, and we cover different subjects on what it is to transition into a guy because, you know, there's many subjects we don't know about. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, you can Google, but, you know, there's something personal about sharing experiences. Mm. So we've, you know, created the FTM Shed and, you know, we come together and we hang out and we talk about stuff that we don't know, like shaving mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, which is a big one because when you want to put a blade to your mm, face, yeah. you kind of really should know what you're doing. And one day I'll be able to utilise that lesson. Sure. And, you know, <laughs> one, one day. One day, yeah. Um, and, you know, and we just share experiences, really. And it's just, it's beautiful because yep. we can talk openly. Because um, I think one of the things that we, we forget is transitioning. We go from talking a lot <laughs> about a lot to not so much, mm. you know, we minimise our, our, our talking and, and the way we verbalise things. Um, and we tend to have been brought up that, you know, guys don't talk. And so the shed kind of has changed that. So and we get to voice it. Yeah, so it's similar to, I suppose, um, people might be familiar with like a men's shed type thing. Is it is it similar to that? Well, um, the men's shed, um, I'm not sure about. I've not mm. actually been to yep. one. But I'm guessing kind of, yep. you know, I think uh, we've just got a lot more to, to cover. They mm. already know how to shave and yep. stuff where, you know, we don't. Yep. And it's different body languages and it's different vocabulary. And, you know, and it brings up a whole range of new stuff that we have to learn and grow into. Yeah. Um, and it's not so simple. So yep. the shed actually provides this amazing space. Yeah. Um, we have a Facebook private page where, you know, even if you're in doubt, you can put a question up that may sound stupid. And, you know, all of us will comment going, yeah, I wondered that too, or <laughs> oh, I, I had this experience, yeah. you know, and we get to just relate it. Yeah. And it gives that thing of you're not the only one, Yeah. you know, because when I transitioned, there wasn't anybody for me to talk to, mm. you know, um, and that's hard. Yeah. That's hard because... As you know, it's not easy, no, it's you know, not. it's just like, well, you know, um, so it's just been an amazing part of my journey. Yeah. Amazing part. And I'm very grateful for it. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, so in terms of, so your own sort of when you decided to transition and, and all that sort of stuff is that I know that you sort of owned your own business when you decided to transition. Um, right. So what, how, how did that go in terms of? Oh, gosh. <laughs> You know, it's really funny. I, I had my own business from a very young age. Um, at that stage, I was supposedly straight. And then uh, during the, a period of time, of course, I came, came out as a lesbian. Now, that was OK, you know, and most people actually didn't have a problem with that. And because in the building industry as a female, most women uh, loved it. So, you know, their husbands would go, we need to get blah, blah. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll get, you know, because mm. I was female, they felt comfortable, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, I've never advertised my, my business. It's always been word of mouth. So when I started transitioning in a small country town, mm. it wasn't so lovely. Yeah. It wasn't so easy. And... Those that I worked for were comfortable enough with me being a lesbian because it wasn't so confronting to them, I think. Mm. But me physically changing and transitioning to male was hard for them to handle. Yeah. And that made it hard for me to handle because they stopped giving me work. Mm. So I pretty well nearly lost everything, um, choosing to transition. But you know what, uh, as hard as it was, 
and as difficult as it was, um, would I take it back? No, never in a million years. Um, I think sometimes we're just unaware of all of the circumstances in the things that we need to do for ourselves, and that was one for me. Hmm. So I moved down to Melbourne. Uh, I was um, lucky to have some amazing support people around me that kind of pretty well covered my ass for a while yeah. um, until things slowly picked back up in Melbourne, and they have done. Yeah. And now I'm back to working like an idiot again that mm. I swore I'd never do. Yeah. Um, yeah, which, you know, you know, why not? And, you know, ultimately because I'm a trans guy now. Yeah. You know, so really at the end of the day, my work hasn't changed. Yeah. But the people around me have. Mm. It, slightly off question, off that, when you started taking testosterone, did work get a little bit easier? Oh, hell yeah. Um, <laughs> luckily, luckily for me, I was fairly strong um, physically because I'd done labouring work and mm. building work all of my life. Uh, so I started off in floor sanding, mm. you know, and that was at 16. So you try floor sanding. It's not light work. Yeah. My floor sander was 267 pounds. Huge. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> As a doctor, I'm glad that you know the difference. <laughs> pounds, you know, pounds. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I would have to pick that that thing up and put it in the back of the ute, yeah. you know. Uh, so I was fairly strong. The minute I started to, oh, my God, apart from three inches across the shoulders in a very short period of time, a sheet of plaster was really light. Yep. It was cool. And just little things like being able to, to go a lot longer with, you know, using a power, with a power drill mm. and one armed. Yeah. Where before I would have to hold, you know, two ants. So I was like, nice. Now I know why guys do it easier. Yeah. Mm. All in a hormone. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, awesome. definitely. Loved it. Cool. Love it. Um, so outside of sort of building, outside of um, FTM Shed, what sort of stuff do you like to sort of get up to? Well, outside of that, my other interest is leather, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, a part of, I suppose, the BDSM world. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm involved or pretty well involved in the leather community within Melbourne um, and part of the US. Mm -hmm. And I go to different places uh, that run leather contests, master mm -hmm. slave leather contests. I have my all my leathers that I love dearly, but yep. it's not about that. The leather to me is about my living values. Yep. You know, it's about how I present myself and uphold myself. And uh, I like to hold myself high in my integrity and my honesty um, mm. and my values. Mm. And to me, that's what the leather's about, so. Cool. Um, we're, unfortunately, we're, out, we're actually running out of time. Just as and we're I about to... get to interview you. I know, I know. Maybe next time. <laughs> All right. So, look, thank you so much for coming on. Thank um, you for asking me. No worries. So, big thank thanks you. to Dee. You've been watching Transmission. Welcome back to Transmission on Bent TV. I'm Sammy Cameron, and today we're talking with Mr. Andrew Ives. Uh, about surgical procedures for transgender people. Andy, thank you for joining us. C can you tell me what informed consent is? Informed consent basically means that uh, the patient is making a decision on any operation in, in full, um, has complete uh, knowledge of the operation and the full facts about the operation, is fully aware of what all the risks are, um, knows the pros and cons of the operation, what the likely sequelae are from having an operation and stuff down the track, um, and, and making sure that um, those patients actually understand and comprehend what they're actually asking you to do. And this is a really important document that you yeah, work it's, through it's, with patients. Yeah, it's, I, mean, I mean, informed consent for any operation is, um, you know, is an important aspect of, of the whole sort of patient uh, management sort of portfolio, if you like, because, you know, they have to understand and comprehend what they're asking you to do uh, because of obviously, um, you know, it's a permanent change no matter what operation it is you're doing. Uh, that your that patient is undergoing, and they've got to be understand that you know you can't just suddenly turn the clock back and go well 
undo what we've done because you can't do that after you've had an operation. Can we talk a little bit about some surgical techniques? Yep, sure. So I wanted to ask about uh, male to female genital yep. surgery. So can you just briefly outline yep, sure. uh, okay. what, what you'd have to do? So, uh, well, the, the operation, I mean, there are different techniques that, that, are, that are performed. Uh, the, 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 operate, the technique that, that I use here is what's called the inverted penile skin technique. So basically what we do is we use the uh, skin of the penis and we use that to line part of the perineum and part of the vaginal cavity. And then I look at, I, I really think of the operation as being in three parts. One is creating the clitoris. Uh, one is shortening and opening out the uh, urethra, which is the tube you wee through. And then the final stage, if you like, is creating the vaginal cavity. So that is sort of like the operation in its sort of basic terms. Make it sound so easy. <laughs> we won't go into too much more detail. <laughs> Female to male chest surgery. Can yep. you tell me about that? Okay, well, that, that operation is, um, again, there are different techniques and a, and a lot of those techniques... Um, in, in my hands, it depends on how much tissue you're, you're trying to remove. Obviously, everyone's different, so some patients' chests are larger than other patients, and it's a question of uh, having to remove not just the, the tissue on the inside, but also get rid of the redundant skin as well. So if a patient's got a lot of redundant skin, um, then you have to remove that, which means they're going to have more scarring. So you sort of have to make an assessment of, obviously, uh, Surgeons, we try and get as minimal scars as we can, but you've got to get the right result with the minimal amount of scarring. So there are different techniques of uh, if there's not a lot of skin and tissue, then you can do a technique of just around the nipple. OK, that's what's known as a periurella approach. Um, and then if there's more tissue, usually... Uh, there's approaches of having the scar basically at the a straight scar at the level of where the, the nipple is going to be placed or one at a lower level where the pec muscle inserts and then the nipple sort of moved up as a graft. So that's briefly what the sort of the, the, the techniques involved are and stuff. And as I say, it's, it's a decision that you sort of make when you sort of have a look at the patient's chest and sort of have a chat to them and stuff about which is the best approach to get the best result. So it's re removing a lot of the a lot of tissue. What about the nipples? Often they have to be reduced in size as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, again, everyone's different and stuff. And some patients have quite large, prominent nipples. Some patients don't. If you move the nipple as a graft, it often flattens out. So sometimes you don't need to do a nipple re uh, revision down the track. Uh, if a patient's got very large nipples at the outset, then again, we can do a nipple reconstruction at, at the same time and actually just use part of that nipple to create a smaller nipple for them. So again, that's sort of all part of the assessment when they sort of come in and we have a look at them. I want to talk about the risks yep. uh, that are involved in these surgeries. Yep. Um, and what are some of the range of things that can go wrong and what are the chances of them happening? Okay, well, when I think about risks for operations, I usually think of them as there are general risks which are risks from any operation be it having uh, having a, a mole taken off all the way up to a heart transplant uh, and those are sort of general risks so things like getting an infection uh, getting a, a wound that opens up getting lumpy scars uh, having um, uh, getting hematomas in the wound or bleeding so they can happen in in sort of pretty much any operation and then there are uh, risk specific to uh, the operations themselves. For example, with the genital surgery with male to females, uh, rectal perforation, rectovaginal fistulas, those are the really big worrying uh, complications that you can get. How often do they occur? Pretty rare. Um, I've only ever seen one rectal perforation since I've been doing it. So they're, they're, they're pretty rare. Um, and you know, in chest surgery, probably the commonest, I would say, probably would be a hematoma in the chest, which is a collection of blood in the chest from where there's uh, not draining. Um, again, that's not very common, but it can occur occasionally. And when these things happen, they're very dangerous? Blood in the chest is not really a dangerous procedure. I mean, you need to get it out, so you need to take them back to the operating theatre and evacuate it just because yeah. it can cause problems down the track for them. Rectal perforation, that's a big dangerous complication and stuff. So, I mean, that needs to be sort of dealt with there and then and stuff. But um, how, how do you prevent that? So during surgery, there's something, there are things you do to try to prevent some of these risks. Yeah, I mean, you, you try and reduce your risks. I mean, um, I always tell patients when, I, when I'm... 
consenting them for or telling them about uh, genital surgery is that you um, we usually give them a little bit of an enema the, the night before, uh, which helps clear out the the lower bowel and stuff, and and that sort of does reduce the risk quite significantly. I also say that when I do the operation. If I'm concerned I'm getting very close to the bowel and stuff, then then I will not try and go any further and create some huge vaginal cavity for them and stuff. I'd rather wake the patient up and say, look, I've had to, we were getting quite close to the rectum. I've, I've given you a slightly shorter vaginal cavity than I anticipated, but we haven't perforated the rectum and stuff. So I tend to be a little bit conservative from that perspective, as I say, rather than, you know, I know some surgeons do try and create these great huge vaginal cavities and stuff but I mean as, as an operation that is the risky part of the operation and I think you need to be a little bit sort of hit that in the back of your mind when you're doing it. Because going wrong is just off, going to be an awful thing for the patient well, for the, quite the, some time afterwards. Well the, the, the methods and the, the uh, procedures that you then have to do to correct that if, if I mean you repair it initially but then you know potentially you can then get fistulae forming and you can be looking at the patient then having to have a you know lots of procedures and in and out of hospital to try and get that fixed and stuff and uh, as I say I, I, I think you know if, if you can avoid it at the outset it's probably best to Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you can deepen a vaginal cavity after it's been created down the track with a further operation. It's a bit more involved and a bit more complicated. But as I say, you've got, you're, then at least you're not increasing the risk of perforating the rectum, which, as I say, is not what you want to have. Andy, thank you so much for talking with us today. Um, very much appreciate it. Pleasure. Uh, and uh, you've been watching Transmission on Bent TV. Thank you for joining us. Welcome back to Transmission on Vent TV. I'm Sammy Cameron, and today we're talking about medical procedures. Uh, joining me today are Fury, uh, Jez, and Nate. Thank you for joining us today. So, have you had the operation? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that an I've, offensive <laughs> question? <laughs> I, I've had, you know, my appendix removed. Fabulous. So, yes, you I have had the operation. Fabulous. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I used to be Tina Arena. So, yeah, I've had a few operations. <laughs> well, when someone asks me that question, I usually say to them, uh, well, you show everybody the room yours and I'll show you mine. And no one's taken me up on the offer yet. <laughs> so you put it back on them. Yeah. yeah, put it back on them. Let them feel uncomfortable. And I'd love someone to take me up on the offer, and if they do, I promise I'll show. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, there's probably just a time and a place for that question. It's, you know. it's, it's not a great question. It's yeah. not something you should ever ask anybody, is it? Mm. Um, it's just really aggressive, mm. you know, yeah. impersonal, like, and it's entitled. Making so many assumptions, mm. like there's the operation. Mm. Mm. So there's one or two, aren't there? <laughs> <laughs> do you think there's a few different sort of surgical, medical procedures that... We can have, do you? There's ridiculously large amounts. Mm. Yeah. Like, you could do anything, really, and nothing's particularly right, nothing's the one, nothing makes you more trans, nothing makes anything. It's just, it is what it is, and some people are comfortable having some operations, other people aren't. It's just whatever. So it's very much an individual yeah. choice about what we feel uncomfortable about mm. and what we need to address. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think there are a lot of people that feel like um, they don't want to have particular surgeries, but there's like this standard uh, narrative or tr traditional way of transitioning, which I think uh, dominates a bit of the trans space. And I think that can make people feel really uncomfortable um, or disempowered when they say, hey, actually, I have a different relationship to my body um, and, and that's not going to work for me. And mm -hmm. I think that it's difficult for people to f find a voice or to feel validated if they feel differently. Mm. Um, Something that I really hear a lot is like I'm not trans enough, so I think that making it like the operation does like invalidate a lot of people's experience and undercut it. So yeah. Mm. So, so there's stigma associated mm. in our own community by our own people that if you don't get follow the standard path that is expected of you, that there's something wrong with you, mm. and people feel that within themselves. Yeah, I, I don't know why that is, whether people um, are, are seeking to be mirrored a lot within the community to validate their own decisions and, and their own identity, but there's certainly um, a diverse range of um, bodies and identities and, 
your desires in our community, wouldn't everyone mm. agree? Yeah. yeah. I think that there's not very many narratives um, from what I've seen um, about that don't adhere to some sort of binary. Mm. Although there are, there are so many more coming up, which is really exciting. Um, but um, in the psyche, in the general psyche, there is a lot of, um, yeah, split still, mm. binary split. Mm. That's true. And so, that's part of that is also that the clinicians that we see try to channel us down that route yeah. and gatekeep and only approve for certain procedures based on, a, on an identity that is still in that binary, yeah. mo that model. So, I, I guess I understand some of the clinician's perspective because some of the procedures that you have are irreversible mm. and that um, they want to know that this is something that you're going to be okay with for the rest of your life. Mm. Mm. But it's still pretty hard, isn't it? I suppose, you know, I lost my appendix. I'm never getting that back. <laughs> yeah, you're anxious, you're anxious about that. Well, I mean, so, you know, and I could make an informed decision to yeah. say, well, yes, I, I'm going to sign the piece of paper to have that removed. And nobody else needed to um, give you any consent no, at all? No, It was just you? Yes. Yeah, whereas for us, we've got to get other people and yeah. convince them mm -hmm. and yeah. use arguments to persuade them to the way that they want to think of yeah, us. Yeah, totally. And I mean, a tattoo is kind of fairly permanent. You know, having a child is fairly, fairly, fairly permanent. You don't get that sort of like rigmarole. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just because it's a, um, a heteronormative narrative, really, mm -hmm. or like a standardly acceptable narrative. This is just something that people don't generally understand. And, and it seems to be the only area of medical intervention of any sort that if this happens for. Mm. People can go and get all kinds of cosmetic surgery, mm. Mm. and they do. Yeah, that's and right. And they don't need to go through a process of, you know, psychological examination and detailed analysis. So yeah, I think it does come into the whole idea of um, making it a mental health issue, like people seeing it as a mental health issue as opposed to um, a self-perception or a self-choice. Yeah. There's a history of that, so I imagine that comes into it. I've, I've often wondered whether it's also about the ability to um, have a baby as well, because I don't think that they want people that are so genderqueer or trans people um, reproducing mm -hmm. outside of the standard binary. So they don't want. I don't think that that society is comfortable yet with trans men having babies. Mm. You know, so. Um, I think a lot of the way that the surgeries and the approvals happen is around still maintaining that heteronormative sort of narrative of if a baby is born, it has to sort of still come from, you know, mm. a woman mm. that looks like a woman, mm. you know? See, I'd almost argue that it would, it, it's slightly different in that there's trying this preservation of that they want you to maintain your fertility. Like, it's kind of this idea that you can't make a decision. So as a 25-year-old guy, you can't make a decision that you never, ever want to have children. And so I, my take on it is it's actually that way, that they're actually going, well, can you make a decision about this? And so, like, well, yes, I can. So it's kind of, yeah, yeah no, preservation. I, I, yeah, I agree. It's definitely that that, that comes into it as well, because I don't think people in their 40s are go through the same processes on the yeah. same, same questions. Um, but there is that, that, that period of like early 20s to like late 30s where things are a lot more intense for people. Mm. I mean, it's one of the questions they ask on the consent form. You know, you actually mm. have to consent that, you know, you know you're going to become infertile if you do this particular procedure and you have to agree to it. And you get, you, you get lectured about it, mm. that do you know these sorts of things? Well, yeah, well, I've already made an appointment to come and see you and I already know what it is I want to do. You're just kind of getting in the way and <laughs> yeah, slowing, me down, slowing me down. <laughs> yeah. And every day that you make me wait longer, I feel more anxious about my body mm. and more uncomfortable about it. Mm. What about the idea of having to go overseas to do surgery? Is that a big challenge for people, do you think? Mm. In terms of access, I suppose, is that there are some places, so particularly in Thailand, there's some really good, uh, there's some surgeons that do a lot of sort of um, surgeries around sort of gender. Um, but there is sort of that access that you have to be able to go overseas and people are potentially losing their support networks and things like that to, to you know, have these procedures and there's also cost involved and things like that. Mm. I know someone who um, married to go to Germany so that they could get the surgery they wanted without paying for it. Um, so there is an access in regards to cost and the fact that, you know, to be who we are, it does cost us money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us um, to talk about this. Uh, I'm Sammy Cameron on Transmission for Bent TV. Look forward to seeing you all next time.